Welcome to week five. You should have read Jeremiah chapter seven through chapter 10, verse 25. Reading the first version of the temple sermon starts in, that's in chapter seven. We will have another one later on in the book. But this one this week in chapter seven uh, is uh, specifically talking, it's a challenge to the false prophets, but it's specifically talking about this false idea of safety in the temple. So uh, Jeremiah stands at the temple gate and he proclaims this sermon and he tells the people, verse 4, do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with, you, with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien and, a, and the fatherless or the widow and do not share innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I've given your forefathers. So a couple things I want to point out in that section. First of all, repetition is an important literary device in Jeremiah. He will repeat words and, and phrases for emphasis often. And here's one time when he says, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Uh, I'm going to explain what that means in just a second, but I also want you to note what he's, the, the, the uh, condemnation he brings against the people, that they weren't taking care of the oppressed and the fatherless and the widow and the orphan and the foreigner and all those things. So again, I just, from last week's uh, lesson we talked about the importance of social justice and, and issues of um, uh, caring for those that are vulnerable in our society. So here, here it comes up again in the temple sermon. But my main point for today is, is what is he meaning about this phrase, temple of the Lord? So what had developed with the people is they had a false theology where they felt safe at the temple. They thought that God would never let the temple be destroyed and as long as they were in the temple that they were safe from the arrows of their enemy. Now where did this idea come from? It actually comes from Isaiah about a hundred years earlier. In Isaiah's time, uh, Assyria is the enemy and Assyria is the one threatening and attacking. And Jeremiah makes some statements, particularly one of importance is, I mean, Isaiah makes some statements. If you look at Isaiah chapter 37, starting in verse 33, he says this, Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter, to, enter the city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. And so what the people had done was take this prophecy and apply it to their own situation a hundred years later and say, see, God will never let the temple be destroyed. He will never let an arrow pierce this area. He will defend it for his name's sake. And Jeremiah in this sermon is saying, uh -uh, don't believe that. And let me give you an example. So he uses Shiloh as his example to show there's been another time that God let his place of worship be destroyed. So starting in verse 12, he says, Now go there, go to the place of Shiloh, where I made my first dwelling for my name. We know that the tabernacle dwelt in Shiloh because we see that's where it was when we have the narrative about Eli and Samuel and Hannah. We don't know what happened to it, but obviously it falls in, in disrepair or it, it's destroyed at some point because he says, you go to Shiloh now and you don't see the place of worship because it was destroyed. And so if God would let it be destroyed there at Shiloh, he will let it be destroyed here in Jerusalem. So his lesson of the sermon, his, his illustration for his sermon is Shiloh. Then notice in verse 16 in chapter 7, he says, so do not pray for these people, nor offer a pre plea or petition for them. Do not plead with me, for I will not listen to you. So this is God telling Jeremiah, don't bother praying for these people, Jeremiah. It's not going to do any good. This was very uh, shocking. This would have been shocking to the readers because this was a role of the the prophet was to intercede for the people. Moses as prophet par excellence, that's what he did. He interceded for his people and he, 
uh, he, he's the representative of talking to God for the people and the dialogue that happens there. But here, God's saying, Jeremiah, don't even bother. Don't pray for them. So it's really just kind of in, showing us the impact of this culmination of God's wrath for the people's disobedience. Often through this book, the theme of lamenting and mourning and grieving is woven all through this. That's why we call Jeremiah the weeping prophet. But sometimes you can't tell who exactly is lamenting. Is it Jeremiah or is it God himself? So sometimes the language is blurred, and I think that's intentional. If you look at chapter 8, verse 18, O oh, my comforter in sorrow, my heart is faint within me. Listen to the cry of my people from a land far away. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king no longer there? Then chapter 9, verse 2, O oh, that I had that I had in the desert a lodging place for travelers so that I might leave my people and go away from them, for they are all adulterers, a crowd of unfaithful people. And then in uh, verse 10 of that same chapter, I will weep and wail for the mountains and take up a lament concerning the desert pastures. They are desolate and untraveled, and the lowing of cattle is not heard. The birds in the air have fled and the animals are gone. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, and I will lay waste the towns of Judah so no one can live there. And the question is, who's saying this? Is this Jeremiah saying God's words? Or is this Jeremiah's words? And, and so this theme of lamenting and sorrow, we're hearing God's lament and sorrow through the prophet Jeremiah. And often those, those are, are merged together. And then again, just pointing out that culture of deception and that he lives among a people of lies, it says in chapter 9. Verse 6, you live in the midst of deception. Right before that in verse 5, friends deceive friends and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongues to lie. They weary themselves with sinning. You live in the midst of deception. In their deceit, they refuse to acknowledge me, declares the Lord. Maybe you feel like that's your context sometimes. I, I work in a prison. And so often I will say this statement to myself. I live among a people of lies. <laughs> They wear themselves out lying to me. And so that's certainly the, Jeremiah's culture. And he's even going to be betrayed and deceived by his own family members, which God told him ahead of time that the whole land would stand against him, and indeed they will. Uh, one other thing, or a couple other things I want to point out in this, this passage, the idea of circumcision. In chapter, 20, uh, chapter 9, verse 25, he says, uh, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all who are circumcised only in the flesh. We think about the Apostle Paul when he talks about being circumcised of the heart and not only of the flesh. But that wasn't new to Paul. This concept of being circumcised of the heart was always the case. The condition of the heart was always important uh, in the Old Testament covenant. And then chapter 10 is kind of a funny uh, narrative about the irony of idols, the sarcasm here of you making an idol with your hands and then giving it power or giving it some type of, of uh, reverence when it's, it's just the product of your hands. In chapter 10, starting at verse 23, it ends with Jeremiah's prayer here uh, that he responds to God as creator and God's wrath being poured out. Verse 25, pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the people who do not call out your name, for they have devoured Jacob. They have devoured him completely and destroyed his homeland. In this lament, it, it just reminds you, yes, Jeremiah is prophesying about the destruction of Jerusalem, but he also lives in Jerusalem. He also is experiencing this terror and this horror of God's wrath being poured out. And so this prayer there at the end of 10 reminds you that he too, it's bringing him no joy to be the bearer of this bad news because he too is having to endure it. Okay, that's all I got for you. See you next week.